The bike chain is over 150 years old and there have been countless attempts to develop something better. There's been belt drives, shaft drives, internal gearboxes and even the ceramic speed driven projects which was said to be the next big thing. But none have succeeded in dethroning the humble bike chain. It really is the hardest working and most underestimated component of your bike. Each link can withstand 50,000 psi of pressure. There's over 700 individual moving components. Its efficiency is rated at 98.3% and it can last well over 30,000 kilometers. And yet some people still complain that the bike chain is too expensive and say that its days are numbered. So why is it we're still using a design that is over 150 years old and why have these other designs not become the go-to choice? To find out, we need to go back to the start. Now long before bikes were a thing, the idea of using a chain and cog was credited to Leonardo da Vinci in the 15th century, which doesn't exactly resemble the bike chains of today. It was another 400 years or so until chains were first used on bikes. Not just any bike, but the bike which changed the world, the safety bicycle. Before this, penny farthings were used with their huge front wheels, and because of that, you didn't need to have a chain, just a set of cranks attached directly to the wheel for a direct one-to-one -one drive ratio. The bigger the wheel, the faster your penny farthing could go. Thankfully, progress didn't stop there, and the most common type of chain used today on our bikes is this, the Bush Roller Chain. It was invented and patented by Swiss engineer Hans Reynold in 1880. The Bush Roller Chain offered a number of advantages over previous designs. It improved efficiency, flexibility, and the performance of a mechanical power transmission. In the case that we're discussing, it helped cyclists to ride further and faster, and chains that would last a much, much longer time. Chains and bikes initially were single speed only, and it wasn't until 1940 when Tullio Campagnolo developed something called the rod gear that allowed for different gear ratios and meant you could easily change them whilst riding your bike. This was a design that eventually evolved into what we know and recognize as the rear derailleur. While the chains used on bikes today are broadly speaking the same as what was developed in the 1880s, the tech and materials used have moved on. Steel is still the material of choice for almost all manufacturers, but not just any old steel or recycled tin cans, but special hardened steel that has been heat treated to help make it super durable. We've got chains with complex angles and chamfers to improve shifting speed and hollow pins and cutaways to help reduce weight. Then there's special surface coatings that some chains have, like a hard chrome or titanium nitride, which not only help to reduce wear, friction and corrosion, but also give the chain some amazing bright finishes and colours. With your average bike chain costing close to £20, Euros or dollars, it seems pretty tough to see something like a belt drive system ever taken over because of the other associated costs. So if you want to use a belt drive system, and have multiple gears, well you need to use some sort of sealed gearbox system, either down at the crank or at the rear hub. This tends to be typically heavier, in some cases more inefficient, but almost always more expensive and more complex. Your typical chain is far simpler. It consists of just four individual component parts. A pin, a roller, inner and outer plates. So your 116 link chain has close to 700 parts to it. Each link is made of two inner plates, two outer plates, one roller and one pin. Each part finished with a smooth surface to an accurate tolerance and is designed to withstand more force than even the world's best athletes can produce. But the chain does have its downfalls too because it needs lubricating correctly and because it's exposed to the elements, wear rates and efficiency can vary hugely too. But this is something that has been widely tested and documented by a number of independent experts around the world. Even back in 1999, a study conducted by the John Hopkins University showed some bike chain setups to be 98.6% efficient and even the worst tested were 81% efficient. So for your average person cycling at 200 watts, we're talking of a power loss between 2.8 and 18 watts in the worst case. Even in the world of professional sports or modern engineering, a 98.6% efficient system leaves little room for improvement. 
Yet hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds and dollars are still being invested trying to develop the next best thing. Back in 2018, the ceramic speed driven concept launched and it basically broke the internet, but never really gained any traction. It looked incredible and was a real work of art, but it was speculated that implementing this system could bump up the retail price of a bike by up to $2,000 which for customers would be absolutely crazy. And even with a reported $2 million worth of investments and a claimed efficiency of 99%, it still hasn't taken off. There are of course other options too. We've seen belt drives and shaft drive ideas too. And whilst I think the belt drive is a brilliant solution in some applications, neither have become mainstream. I think this is largely down to the balance of cost versus performance. You see, a simple law of physics is that nothing can ever be 100% efficient. So that means whatever design you come up with, whoever you are, and no matter how much money you throw at the problem, the best ever outcome you can get is gonna be an improvement that is less than 1.4% over the already optimized bike chain, which best case scenario sits at 98.4%. And that is a design that has stood the test of time and has been refined over and over again. Now these other systems are great, and in certain applications, they are the better solution, but almost always with added significant expense. Take a belt drive, for example. You need special chainring, special sprockets. It rules out the option of using a normal cassette and derailleur, and typically, you're gonna need a specially designed frame. Shimano SRAM and Campagnolo are crazy expensive, but they're top of the tree Halo products, and there are far more affordable parts and components that the majority of people and the world are using. We've got low cost bikes, single speed bikes, kids bikes, commuter bikes, city hire bikes, and so on. These are all using chains and drivetrain components that probably cost less than five pounds each. And with other designs, it's just simply not possible. For me, this is ultimately the big downfall of these alternative solutions. Bikes are already more expensive than we would like them to be. And implementing these different drivetrain solutions industry-wide is gonna add significant expense to our bikes. And it's for that reason alone that I cannot ever see these designs taken off and becoming mainstream. I think they'll remain great solutions in niche applications, but I'm gonna say it right here, I don't ever see the humble bike chain ever being replaced. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll be proved wrong in five years, 10 years, 15 or 20 years time. But if I am, that'll be great because it means there's been a design solution implemented that is more effective and more cost effective too. So there you go. There's my thoughts on the subject. Please do share your thoughts in the comments section down below. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a big thumbs up. And if you want to help support what we do, subscribe to GCN Tech and turn on your notifications. Right, I'm out of here. See you later. Bye.